Hey, I think I'm on now. Sorry guys, I had to uh, cancel the, the planned one and start a new one. I'm not sure what happened there. So, I'm just gonna go ahead and do a little update on the other one. Joining it now. I have never done a live video before, so bear with me, people. Um, oh, there we go. There's that. That's where the comments come from. I'm not sure if I canceled the other one, but um, this is where I will be live streaming from right now, since I clearly cannot do the uh, the planned one. Sorry about that. Okay. I'm going to wait just a minute so if people got confused, like I was confused, and we're looking at the other video, they can jump over to this one. All right. So, great, okay, I see people, there we go, come on. Thanks for, um, thanks for joining this webinar. I can't promise the next one will be any more polished than this, because I don't know what I'm doing with technology. Um, but, I am Christine Cohen, author of The Winter King, and, um, I thought I'd give some backstory first on why I wanted to do this webinar. Because while The Winter King is my first published novel, um, I have written five full length novels uh, and I'm working on my sixth one right now. So most of those um, won't see the light of day. But I feel like I've learned quite a lot during uh, the past 10 years that I've been writing, uh, at least that I've been intentionally pursuing writing um, oh, hi, William. I love this. I can see comments here. Yes, please feel free to uh, leave me a comment or a question. Um, I'll, I'll leave time hopefully at the end for some questions so you could jump in then. Otherwise, I may not, I may not catch them. Um, but every writer is different the way you go about writing a story. Um, and sometimes every book can be different. So things that have worked well in when I've written one novel, I've tried to then use in another novel and they haven't worked. Um, every story is hard to write. That's something that I am learning. It does not seem to get, it, in some ways it gets easier, but um, it's never not a difficult thing to write a story. You will have a problem at some point in the process. Even if you try to like graph out or chart out the entire story from the get-go, uh, you'll still run into to snags down the road. Um, but these are things um, that, tips that I think hopefully are universal in terms of getting started. So today is just the basics. Um, and when I mentioned that I was going to do a webinar on Instagram, I asked some people for questions, uh, anything that they might want to know about writing a novel. And so I'm gonna try to answer some of those uh, with the basics here today. Uh, and a lot of the questions were, how do you decide on the story you want to share? How do you get started? How do you decide on age group, genre, that sort of thing? So uh, with the question of how do you start writing, uh, I think I would start by saying that you start writing by doing a lot of prep work and a lot of thinking ahead of time. I think a lot of times people start writing too soon you need to have a pretty solid idea in mind of what you're going to write about before you get started. It can be easy to get super excited about an idea or a concept and think, well, I'll just start writing because I have the ideas here. But most likely you don't have the ideas for the entire uh, story in your head. So it, it really does help you to come as prepared as you can be. But on this note, I think it's also important to know the type of person that you are 
There are some people who I think are more likely to rush in head first before they're totally prepared. And then there are other people who might research themselves to death. Uh, so if you're writing historical, maybe you're spending like months researching uh, it, Rome in the ninth century, or you have spent so long getting to know your characters that you know like their favorite color and what Hogwarts house they'd be sorted into, but you haven't actually started writing. So knowing which one of those temptations you might want to tend to fall into and then trying to steer a path through the middle there. Um, so the, the, the question of like, where did these kernels of ideas come from? Uh, they really can come from anything, at least for me. I have had ideas come from a song I've been listening to, um, like a particular lyric that strikes in a certain way, a phrase, a uh, person in my life, uh, a weird what if question. When these little rabbit trail of ideas pop up, I think it's really helpful to have an idea journal that you can write them down in and store them away for later use. So if you ever are stuck with a moment where you're like, I want to write another story, but I don't have any ideas, you can look back through that for ideas. I actually, I've used this um, metaphor a lot, but I like to think of them more as balloons. And like you're, you're slowly collecting these balloons of ideas uh, until at some point you have enough where you have lift off and you can start writing. So for the Winter King, uh, it was several different balloons. Um, the first one was uh, reading Till We Have Faces by C.S. Lewis. And I thought um, that, I, I read that book and I thought that's exactly what I want to, um, to write. It's like a myth reimagined. And then another, um, another balloon was the phrase from a TV show that I have not watched called that said, winter is coming. And I thought that's a really ominous phrase. Um, and I thought, what if that winter was a person, a god? And then uh, another balloon was the myth of Hades and Persephone, um, the tragic loss of a daughter, the wrath of the gods. And then the last one was actually the movie The Village, M. Night Shyamalan's The Village. So once I had all these kind of different things that I loved, um, I was able to put those together and, and have liftoff and, and start writing The Winter King. Um, but so I had this concept in my head, but what's funny is that um, that concept has stayed the same from the beginning. So, so much so that it, it like it's made its way onto my back jacket blurb, I think. I don't have a copy of my book right now, but I think it says like a village trapped in winter, a tyrannical god, and a girl who will do anything to keep her family alive. So that that concept, um, it's not really, it's not plot, but the concept stuck with me from the get-go. That was like all the balloons. So you'll have your idea or your ideas, um, these things that will exist in like a shiny, perfect form in your head. Um, and if you don't have those ideas, if that's where you're at right now, as you're thinking, I don't, I don't even have an idea for a story, I guess I would suggest that you start by consuming um, more stories or watch good movies uh, or TV, uh, listening to music, like doing these sort of artistic, um, I think of it as like filling the creative well um, and, and kind of holding it loosely and waiting for something to strike. Uh, even if that something is just, wow, I want a story that's just like this book I just read. I want to write something like that. That's a, that's a really good place to start from. So, um, so now you need to flesh this out. Um, when you're trying to figure out what you're going to write, uh, I would also suggest that you not try to write just what you think you should write to be taken seriously or uh, because you're trying to impress someone. I would write what you love to read. So write characters that are similar to the ones you love to spend time with. So for me, I knew that one of my favorite life experiences so far were the books that I read when I was an early teenager, like 13, 14, 15. Those books were really magical and transporting and uh, they dealt with older, more difficult problems. I was reading Megan Whalen Turner and Diana Wynne Jones. Uh, Shannon Hale, Patricia St. Reed, and I thought, um, I want to write for that age group. So why do you, uh, I guess the, the question is, who do you like telling stories to? 
Another way to say to that is who is your target audience? Um, is it, do you like to write picture books? Are you someone who likes to draw and have a, a shorter plot that you can read aloud to maybe younger siblings? Um, are you writing for middle grade readers? Um, this, this is just a really important thing to nail down early on is, um, is who your target audience is because that is going to influence uh, particularly the age of your main character. So um, if you are writing for middle grade, that then, which is eight to 12 year olds, then your main character should be around 11 or 12. If you enjoy writing to older teenagers, uh, make your character 16 to 18. If you want to write adult fiction, um, you can kind of do whatever you want. <laughs> they don't have as, as many rules as children's fiction does. Um, but going along with this, I think another good question to ask is what age of main character would best serve your story? There are certain tropes or plots that are better for certain age groups. So are you writing about talking animals? That's more likely to be middle grade than young adults. Is it um, a quest that two kids go on with the help of an older, wiser mentor? That sort of older, wiser mentor trope or character is, again, middle grade. Um, is it more of a coming of age story, uh, a story of someone figuring out their place in the world and leaving home, striking out on their own? Is it going to have romance? That's more young adult or adult. So what this comes down to, though, is not the writing style. You can have beautifully written middle grade literature I just read a couple books by Lauren Wolf. Uh, she wrote Wolf Hollow and Beyond the Bright Sea. Those are both middle grade and they're just um, exquisitely written. So it's not that, that the younger you are, the more simplistic your writing has to be. Um, it's content related. And there are very strict age requirements in New York publishing. So if you're thinking to yourself, I wanna write this uh, and try to get it published, then, then you really wanna stick to those, those age groups. Um, so then the next question that you or I ask myself is, uh, what genre is this going to be in? Um, this is different than age group. Young adult is not a genre. Are there fairies or wizards or tree sprites or trips to the underground, uh, the underworld? Uh, that's going to be fantasy. Is it a modern murder mystery or an alter alternate historical fiction? You'll want to figure out your genre and really and stick to that. I watched a TV show recently that promised to be historical fiction, and then in the final episode of the first season, they dropped this supernatural time warp thing on me, and I was just floored. It was like a strong right turn, and it was not okay because I had not signed up to watch. I like supernatural stories, but not when I'm expecting historical fiction. So uh, you need to, to make sure that you're not setting up and promising a certain um, genre and then changing halfway through because halfway through you were like, you know what would be cool in this story are wizards. Uh, so don't, don't do that. Um, I feel like my screen keeps flickering on and off, which seems ominous. Can you guys see me okay? Could someone put on here if, I'm, if I've gone black or something? I don't know, the, the screen. Hopefully I'm still going. Fingers crossed. So uh, one thing I think, um, that's helpful when figuring these things out is, is looking at what you've written down in your uh, journal and asking yourself, why do I love these stories? Did you watch Pirates of the Caribbean recently and think, I want to write a story that makes me feel the way I feel when I watch Pirates of the Caribbean? Okay, so flesh that out. What does that mean? What is it that you love about that movie or this book that you've read? Uh, is it the adventure with a side of humor? Is it magical undead creatures? Is it the period costumes? Uh, figuring out why you love what you love can help you decide what to put into your story. I think we don't often give this enough credit. I've listened to a lot of great podcasts and so many times writers will talk about how their stories came out because someone said, wouldn't it be cool if, you know, okay, I see yes. Does that mean that I'm, oh, it keeps pausing for someone. 
I'm just going to take a minute here and try to figure out what's going on. Um, I'm on, I mean, I'm on my internet access here, but I'm also in rural Idaho, so it is possible that my internet is just not the most awesome, but all right, well, I'll, I'll keep going and maybe next time I will try to do this from my phone and use my, not, not be on Wi-Fi. Um, so, but going back to this, like, what is it that, that you love so much about maybe Lord of the Rings? Maybe it's not the high fantasy world building aspect. Maybe you just really love uh, the big ensemble cast all working together towards a common good. You can do that in a modern day high school. Uh, I'm a sucker for books with mood that just like drips off the pages. The way that each of the Narnia stories has a different and distinct mood. You, um, you think of the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and you think of the snow and lampposts and Father Christmas. You think of the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, and you think of gold and the sun, and sailing east. So I love that. I love the way there's different moods for different books. And I made sure to put a lot of mood into the Winter King. So it feels like a frozen, dangerous Nordic world. But I'll talk about mood more in another webinar. I decided it needed more time on its own because I think that's a really important part of writing a story. For a story that um, I'm planning on returning to one day, uh, that I'd like to get published. I, I wrote it when I wrote it. I had just read Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norell, and I thought I want to write that in young adult form. It's this epic, like 600 page alternate historical fantasy. And what I loved about it was the time period, the magic, these mysterious, monstrous realm. So I spent a good bit of time researching different settings. I thought about New Orleans, Rome. Greece, but I ended up landing on Venice and I kept the idea of a magician's guild and monsters that show up in the waters. And, and from there, I, I formed my plot around that. So you get to be, when you're writing a story, you get to be like a reverse archeologist. When you're starting a novel, you get to bury all of your favorite treasures inside of your novel, which is just, that's one of the best things about writing. So by now you have your target audience, and your genre, you know what things you love, what you'd like to put in your story. These are really helpful things uh, to write down and then paste beside your computer so that when your brain starts to wander, should I add the wizards to my contemporary mystery? You can say, no, I am not writing fantasy. I will not put that in. Um, I really, I paste a lot of things beside my computer because brains are funny things and you can just get sidetracked really easily. Um, but with this, with these things, you're still not ready to start writing yet. Because if you think, I want to write a middle grade fantasy novel about magical psychic hamsters who belong to the son of the French ambassador, that's not a story yet. That's just a concept. You need some plot to go with it, but we're not going to talk about plot yet. Uh, we're still kind of figuring out what story we're wanting to tell, um, which leads to what I think can be a major pitfall in stories. And it relates to a question somebody asked me on Instagram. So someone asked, um, how do you make analogies good, but not preachy? Which I think another way to, to put that would be, how do you write a story with a very clear moral, where you have this character represents X and this one represents Y, or like the white whale represents this. Um, Someone, uh, I, I think that if you set out to write a morality tale or uh, analogies like this, I think that if you're like, I'm going to write a tale that will make kids not talk to strangers, and you start from there, then you're, you're fairly likely to get a pretty flimsy story. Or at least you'll have a story that's a very specific genre, which is a fable. And... And I don't think that that's the best way to go about it. Uh, fables serve a very specific purpose, but it's not really what you're wanting to do. Lewis, of course, wrote a very obvious analogy, and that worked amazingly well for him. But for every Lewis, I think there are probably countless more stories where someone tried to write an analogy and ended up sounding like a parent just trying to get their kids to do something, 
you know. Once upon a time, there wasn't a boy, there, there was a boy who wouldn't eat his green beans, and then the green beans ate him. The end. Like, that's, you don't want to do that. Luckily for you, um, the world is structured in a way that you can't write an amoral story. It's either a good or a bad story. It's either so saying something true or false about the world. So it's less about trying to tack a moral onto a story. I think it's much more about trying to find the truth that's already in your story. So with The Winter King, I didn't sit down and decide, I'm going to write a story showing how false religion and suppression of knowledge can corrupt the truth and control large groups of people. Uh, I also didn't sit down and say, I want a story that shows how people cope poorly with grief and anger. Um, I think that a lot of times the best thing to do is to tell your story and then go back and look at what themes naturally rise out of it and then flesh those out. I think you'll get a much more natural story that way. Or it's possible you'll know ahead of time what you are exploring, but I would make sure that first and foremost, you're writing characters who are true, who are acting in true ways, not characters who are like cardboard cutouts that you're directing around. And we could talk more about that when we get to the character uh, webinar. That being said, it's perfectly acceptable and even, I think, recommendable to have certain characters in your story representing certain types of people. So I'll touch on this more when we get to plot, but all stories are retellings of old stories. And one of the ways to ensure you're telling a successful story is to recycle uh, a story or a part of a story that stood the test of time, right? There's nothing new under the sun. We are all recycling and retelling um, myths, biblical stories, fairy tales, etc. So I can't really talk about The Winter King too much without giving it away um, when I talk about analogies, in case you haven't read the book yet. But I'll talk about the story I'm working on right now. I have a character who is very much a Haman figure from the Book of Esther. He is setting up his little plots and trying to bring other people down. And so I'm going to have him hang himself on his own gallows at the end of the story. Not literally. Uh, all that night, actually. I haven't written it yet, so we'll find out. But I think if you're having your characters act in a way that's congruent with how the world works, then you'll be making an analogy that's good. And it won't come across as preachy. It'll just come across as consistent and true. And any analogy will break down somewhere. And I think it's good if they do. I've had people ask me uh, what the wolves in The Winter King symbolize. And again, I'm not going to answer that on here. But if, um, they do have a significance, which I hint at in several ways. Um, but it does break down at some point, And I think that that's that's good. So by the end of this brainstorming session, hopefully um, you have enough balloons now that you can start to unpack your novel. Now, uh, before you start writing, though, you need to figure something else out, which I call, and this is not my terminology, everyone calls it the elevator pitch. This is where you figure out your who, your what, your where, and your why. Oh. my timer. So, uh, and what we're working on here is being as short and succinct as possible. Because the more succinct you can be, the sharper and clearer your idea of what your story is, you can build out from there. Um, so your who, obviously, is your character, maybe one or two um, it's possible you already know this. Maybe you started with a character balloon. I don't think I ever do. Um, maybe you thought, I want to write a story about a girl who disappears when she's nervous. That's great. Uh, what type of world would best serve that story? So you have your, you, you figured out your girl, your main character. Now you need to think of your where. Is it 18th century England? Is it modern day? Is it going to be a fantasy world? And maybe there isn't a rational answer to this. It's not like you have to 
to, it's not like you can be like, well, studies have shown that stories with disappearing main characters do best in this. Um, it's, it's really more of like a gut instinct. So I think if you've decided I'm going to write a historical romance set in 18th century England about a girl who disappears when she's nervous. So there you've got your who and your where. But let's say that like me, you don't often start with character. Maybe you started with an idea. Uh, I want to write a story. This was the one I was working on about an 18th century Venice populated by magicians and monsters. So that was what came to me for, uh, for one of my novels. If, if that's the case, then you need to decide who your main character will be. And that is going to depend very much on the story you're telling. But he or she needs to be someone who can do the most to propel the plot forward and open up the world around you. So for this Venice story, I made my main character the daughter of a Venetian nobleman because that gives her access to a lot of different parts of Venice that I needed my plot to go into, my characters to go into. And it also gave her a very specific knowledge about the city and also a very limited knowledge about other parts of the city. So since Venetian noble women, um, well, they actually had more rights as women than most medieval women did, but they were still pretty limited. So when she ventures into the magician's guild and these other parts of Venice, she comes in as an outsider which means I get to give the reader this sense of wonder and danger in the unknown because the character whose point of view they're seeing the world from uh, also feels that way, the danger and excitement. So it's, it's important to figure out like what your character might know, what, what their life experiences would be and how that could help you with the plot. So to go back to the Winter King, again, I didn't start with Cora. I started with a village that's controlled by fear. And so I knew I would either start with a character who's essentially brainwashed and needs to be roused out of her stupor, or I could start with someone who's an outsider already and is already suspicious of the religion. And um, those would be two very different stories. And of course I went with the latter, but also I knew she needed to be poor. Her family needed to be on the outskirts there's a level of desperation to her life that makes her journey possible. And that wouldn't have happened if she was like the well-to-do daughter of a merchant. So when you consider your main character and who they should be just on that very superficial level, uh, we're not talking about personality here. We're talking about their age, their family, their social position, these external factors that will greatly influence what happens in the story. Uh, and what I'd recommend is, since this is your blank slate moment here, to just make them someone interesting. So you've got your, you've got your what uh, next. You've got your who and your where, so we move on to the what. And this question is, what does your main character want? We'll talk a lot more about characters later, but uh, some basic questions you should be thinking about from the get-go with your character is, what do they love? What do they fear and what do they want? But for the purpose of um, this, we're going to focus on uh, what, what is the thing, we're looking at action here. What is the thing that they're going to do? And then lastly, and this ties in, why are they going to do it? So um, the why here is, is the stakes. Why does Frodo agree to take the ring to Mordor? Because if he doesn't, everyone dies. So think of your, your story as starting out normal, and then it gets thrown into chaos, right? There's this incident that happens that changes the normal, that flings your character into motion. And what thing must that character do in order to establish a new normal? How will you resolve this chaos that you have created. So if we want to use the Winter King as an example, uh, this, is, this might be a pitch for that. Um, after a Nordic god curses her village with winter, 16-year-old Cora plots to steal the book that holds his secret and save her family from starvation. So the who here is Cora, right? 16-year-old Cora. The where is the Nordic village. The what is that she's plotting to steal a book with secrets 
and the why is to save her family from starvation. So if you've read the book, you know that um, a few chapters in, something happens that basically dooms her family to starvation through this hard winter unless something happens, unless she can do something to stop it. So the, the why is, is pretty clear. She wants to save her family. Um, so again, like I said, this type of thing is called the elevator pitch, and it's just so incredibly essential for distilling your novel. When you start out small, you can build out the plot from there, but that, that pitch is something that I would hang beside my computer when I'm writing to remind me of the forward motion of my story, what my story's goal is. Um, incidentally, I was just listening to a webinar by Kate Messner, and she said that one thing she does is she has two sticky notes. So she'll have the, the my book is about, and that's a plot. My, my book is about 16-year-old Cora saving, wanting to save her family. But underneath that, she has another sticky note that says, my book is really about. And that is sort of like the heart of the story. Um, that again goes back to the analogy uh, or the allegory idea. What's the moral that you are, are telling in this story? Um, I probably for the Winter King put something like how we use grief and pain to excuse our actions. Or maybe how true religion can be distorted by corrupt leaders. Something like that. Um, there's lots of things a book can be about, but that, that really is kind of what you're talking about, like the heart of the story. So if you came into, into writing thinking, like we talked about, I really want to tell a story that's speaking to X situation, you could put that on the second line, but still make sure that the decisions you make are true to your plot as well. So um, that was kind of the basics there. If you, if you want some homework for this week, because who doesn't, <laughs> what else are we doing right now? That's really going to depend on where you're at. If you're struggling to come up with an idea, I would say, again, to read or reread books that you love and see if that brings up anything. There are also places you can go online for writing prompts. You can think of a what if question, or you could start a creativity journal. But I wouldn't try to force this part. I would let try to let the ideas come naturally. Sometimes it will take me just a full month of thinking through a story and gathering balloons, where I even sit down and start brainstorming the elevator pitch. If you have an idea, but you need to flesh it out, then you could use this week to figure out your target audience and your genre. And I would also recommend finding books in the genre, genre you're wanting to write and skimming them for ideas. How do they introduce characters? What's the arc of their stories? How do they alternate dialogue and, and plot? Um, try to come up with this basic elevator pitch of the who, the what, the where, and the why. Because um, honestly, I've talked to so many people who have written these long, sweeping, epic novels, but when I ask them to tell me what it's about, they aren't able to. They start with the backstory or they kind of jump around. And um, the smaller you're able to condense your novel, the easier it will be to stay on course when you're plotting. And also, if you ever are trapped in an elevator with an editor and they say, so what's your book about? You can give them this quick one-liner instead of doing what we all do. I've done this so many times. Is like, well, it's it's about, or let me back up. It's really about this, but then there's this character and this happens. And, um, so next week we'll talk about characters, populating this world with characters and starting to plot. Um, if anyone has any questions, you could you could ask them now. You can also, um, I think, hopefully, when I end the live video, it's going to save it. Um, and you can watch it later. So if you're watching this later and you want to ask a question, you can put it in the comments. You can also find me on Instagram, um, Christine Cohen author, I think, underscore author, maybe. Um, I tend to be more active on there. Um, but if you, if anyone has a question, I seem to have a major lag in between when I'm talking and when things are popping up in my feed. Oh, 
Hey. I just noticed. Okay. I didn't realize I could scroll down on the questions. Sorry, Sarah. It sounds like things are not working out super well <laughs> for you. Um, well, if yeah, if anyone wants to ask questions, and if this was like super glitchy, I might try re-recording it and just posting it as its own video. Um, I'll just give a tip or two since I'm at the end here. Um, but if you're wanting to increase your productivity this week uh, with writing, my first tip is to set a goal. And for me, when I'm actively writing, I set myself a goal of 500 words a day. It doesn't actually take that long. That's often about the length of the scene. You can also do um, 20 minutes on the timer. Just make sure that during that time that you're actively writing or editing that you're not scrolling Facebook or checking Pinterest for something. And um, tip number two would be to be patient. It took me nine years from when I first started writing to when I held a book in my hands. Um, I spent a long time. A lot of those were like months of waiting on agents or on editors for feedback. Um, it's just, it's a long game and during those times of waiting, you really do need to fill your time, not to uh, not be sitting there refreshing your, your Gmail. So I, I'd recommend starting a new project or refilling your creative well, doing something to, um, to keep you inspired. Okay. Um, let's see. Dan says, is there a sequel to the winter King? I, and you loved it. Thank you. I'm so glad that you enjoyed it. Um, I do not have a plan for a sequel right now. I felt like I wrapped up the world pretty pretty neatly. I did leave one thread open, which you probably noticed, um, in case I do ever feel like going back. The funny thing is that I love that world and I love those characters so much that I am I am tempted to go back and write a sequel, but I don't know if, if I necessarily, if there needs to be one. And I don't want to just write a sequel because um, because I want to spend some more time in in the world, I, I feel like I would need to do it justice and um, and really think it through. But I'm curious to know what Crimsby's like in the summer. You know, I uh, every time I mention the Southern merchants coming in or just like the world outside of Crimsby, I would think, I wonder what it's like in the Southern Kingdoms. I wonder what Cora would do if she ever had a chance to get out of Crimsby. So. Who knows? We'll see. But right now, the books I'm working on are um, are in complete. Okay, let me see. I had another question. Let's see. Okay. Okay. So Holly and I was. Um, oh, this is yeah. This is a great question. So, what qualifications do I give myself for whether or not a novel should be published? Um, so the ones that I trashed. <laughs> and actually, what's funny is I, I wrote two that I immediately threw away because I kind of knew that the, my first shot was not going to be my best uh, work. And then the second one even was also not good enough. And, and when I say not good enough, um, it was like, you know, I envision it sort of like a craftsman building a chair. The first two you could not sit on. Like, they were just splinters everywhere. It was real bad. And um, and I also, like, I feel like with most stories, you can always go back and polish. You can have, everyone writes really bad first drafts. That's part of it. So it's, it's a little bit difficult to use, like, the first draft aspect as the litmus test. But um, I, I also felt like I did not love those stories enough to go back and write them, write more. And this came out more in, I wrote, I actually did write a, a contemporary murder mystery in after the winter king well while it was on submission and i was waiting for months i i just thought well i'll write another one and i and i was curious if i enjoyed writing murder mysteries and uh in a contemporary setting and i just didn't i wrote the whole thing i loved a lot of aspects of it but i didn't feel like there was enough in it um to where i i felt like i wanted to spend much time 
um, reworking them. Because the thing is, you will, if you do get a book published, you will spend so much time working on it that by the end you will be truly sick of it. Um, and I, and so you really have to ask yourself, like, is this a world that I want to spend the next however long, six months, year, two years of my life, uh, revising? But if it comes down to like it just not being finished enough or um, or polished or something, I wouldn't go on that for um, for my criteria because you can fix just about anything, even if it's sometimes you have to start almost completely from scratch again. But if you know that the concept is solid, um, then then you know go ahead and keep working on it. Let's see. Thanks, Dave. I do you, you liked the book. Um, Okay, so uh, Carolyn says, I have, I have trouble making my stories long enough. How do you make sure your stories are fully fleshed out? Um, I actually have the opposite problem <laughs> where my characters, like I could, especially if I like them, sometimes they will have conversations that are completely pointless and I have to go back and cut them. And I always resist, my, my critique partners will be like, this, this entire conversation gets you nowhere. And I'm like, but it was interesting. I liked listening to them talk. So I tend to overwrite rather than underwrite. Um, I think though that one of the ways you can you can get help with that is if you have beta readers, so someone who, who um, you trust to read it, and if there are parts where they feel like, you know, we've all read those stories where we're like, wow, that, that part really snuck up on me. That relationship seemed like it came out of nowhere, or that person's, um, motivations didn't make sense to me. Sometimes what what actually needs to happen is that you just need to uh, give more page space to your characters. Um, if they're hopping really quickly from one decision to the next, sometimes they do just need like breathers. Um, so you can ask a, a, a beta reader to just kind of mark the spots where in their brain they think, oh, that, that was fast, like that happened too quickly. If you find that you are summarizing too often, sometimes we will do that because it's an easy way to get from one place to the next. And maybe you actually needed to write out that conversation or write out that set of actions. Um, sometimes you need more description. There's a lot of a lot of different things that, that could possibly make it more fleshed out. If, um, if you feel like your story is too linear, it's possible maybe you need to add a, a full like subplot. Um, and I think someone asked me about subplots, and so I, I'll talk about that in another webinar. Um, let's see. Okay, yeah, so that was similar to Nathan's question. How do you make your books uh, so long? Um, in your opinion, is self-publishing a viable method of birthing one's novel into the world? I like that question. Uh, it It is a viable method. Um, it's a tricky one. So there are people who have done it really successfully. Um, but for one thing, sometimes people think that they want to self-publish because they have shopped their book around to all agents, tried as many editors as possible, and nobody liked it. And so they think, well, they're all wrong, but I, I'm going to self-publish it anyway. So that would be like the danger of self-publishing, is you can get people who the story really wasn't ready for the world. It needed more editing. It needed some refinement, um, but they they didn't want to go through that extra work, and so they self-published. On the flip side, there are stories that, um, for whatever reason, the marketing world goes in trends, and your story just was not what they wanted to pick up, and so you um, you can make that decision. You've hopefully done your work on it. it it's um, really nice and polished. Maybe you've even hired a freelance editor to look it over. That those types of um, things that 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 you would still be getting if you went with a traditional publisher. Um, the thing about self-publishing is that I think it takes an, just an even extra amount of marketing that maybe you um, you don't want to. It depends on your personality. Maybe you're totally down with with that much uh, sort of marketing and creating yourself um, as a brand, like completely separate from a publishing house. But for me, I cannot, um, I really struggle with 
drawing or any sort of graphics. And so the fact that I did not have to have any input in my cover and I was given the most beautiful cover ever um, was just made it totally worth it. I'm not good with um, typesetting or like there's just a lot of things that that I cannot do myself and um, that a publisher did for me. And, and um, so let's see, how do you make your story exciting? Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, you, I would say there's a couple things. One is you need to write things that make you excited. So if you are, if you, if it gets your heart racing, just thinking about something, um, then put that in. I also think that if you can, um, throw your characters into increasingly difficult situations, chase them up a tree, set the tree on fire. <laughs> I don't remember whose analogy that was. Uh, that's a great way to, to make a story exciting. Um, with The Winter King, I've been asked about this a lot because it is meant to be a page turner. It's, um, and I intentionally ended my chapters at a place where people would not want to put the books down put the book down. Um, and so that that's another thing you can do is try to not end your chapters on an exhale, but end them, end them when people are holding their breath. Um, how do you put your books together so beautifully? That's a very kind question, Poppy. Um, I, oh, a lot of practice and a lot of reading. I have read a lot of books. So I think that the more you read, the more you have, um, to draw from for your stories. Okay, Allie, when did you start writing uh, The Winter King? Okay, I started writing it um, when I was pregnant with my son, and he is now almost five, so five years ago. Um, it was a long, a long time ago. It took a long time to get it out into the world. And how do you make sure all your stories aren't too similar? Hmm. I think we can talk about this. That's a really good question. Um, and there's, there's two sides to that. One is that um, in one sense, we love to read authors. We love to pick up books by an author and expect something similar, right? So when you, when you say who are your favorite authors, you're often thinking like, okay, Diana Wynne-Jones has a very specific um, type of style of writing and characters and like a flavor to her books that's very different than Shannon Hale or Lewis or Tolkien. So in one sense, it's okay if your books are similar in terms of like people read them and they're like, that's a Christine Cohen novel. Um, that That's great. Like I'm, I'm really happy with that. Um, when it comes to the actual plot, like the skeleton of the story, I would just make sure that you're not reusing the same skeleton. And we can talk about that more in plot because that's kind of a big, big question. But um, making sure that your the thing that happens at the beginning um, that sets off the whole story isn't the exact same from book to book, that you don't have the same rise and fall of um, of plot points that your characters don't, aren't just um, kind of tropes of each other. Uh, let's see. Okay, did you have to do much research for The Winter King, like the setting or time period? Yes, so much research. And this was partially because even though it's a fantasy world, I wanted it to feel like a consistent fantasy world, like something that could have happened in, um, I'm trying to remember, I think I picked like the 1100s in sort of a Scandinavian village. So I, or I call it Nordic. Um, but because of that, because I wanted it to be consistent, I didn't want to have um, in one scene, my character holding an, uh, I don't know, a pitcher of water. And in the next, she's like turning on a faucet, right? Like you need to make sure even in a fantasy world, and I would say, especially in a fantasy world, because we can, get lazy with this, that um, that you're setting it in a particular time and that the technology is all about the same. Or if it's not, that you're nodding to it in some some way. Like it's it's medieval Europe, but there's also cell phones or something. Um, 
So I did a lot of research on that. And then I also did a lot of research on sort of the flora and fauna of Nordic countries. Because again, I didn't, I wasn't setting it specifically in Sweden or Norway or, or something, but I knew I was setting it in that area. And so I wanted to have um, types of foods that they eat and the animals that they hunt and, um, and the weather, the conditions be pretty similar to, to that area. Although I did have to make a couple little adjustments just, and I could because it's fantasy. Um, but I think that that really helps to give the world weight and a feel to it like this, this actually might have happened. Um, is the Winter King going to be released in the UK? I don't know my <laughs> publishers about this, but I, if I released, you mean like, will it be in bookstores there? I'm not sure about that, but I do know that you can purchase the book um, on Amazon or even um, I think Canon Press uh, ships to the UK. So I think there are ways to, to get a hold of it. Um, let's see, what if the book, the book writer you got the ideas from realizes that your book is super similar? Okay, yeah, so you do want to make sure that um, when you're writing that you're not being derivative of another author. So when I was uh, 12, 13, 14, I wrote a whole lot of, I wrote an entire fantasy series called The Mindling, and it was about small people with furry feet who went on adventures with wizards and dwarves. But I was like, they're different than hobbits because they can read minds. Um, and that type of story, it, so for one thing, I had such a wonderful time writing that story. It was one of my favorite things. I still look back on that period of time as, as just one of the most enjoyable of my childhood. But I was never, I did never, I never planned to publish that. That was more just for me working on my, my craft and, um, and figuring out how to tell stories. And so I think if it's too similar, then, um, then you should probably not, not seek to publish it, but just write it for your own enjoyment. I mean, that's what fan fiction is all about, right? We, we love a certain world so much that we want to write more stories that take place in that world. And I think that that's a great, um, exercise. It's actually a really great writing exercise because you don't have to do quite so much work up front. You can, you're taking somebody else's world and characters and just kind of playing around with them. Uh, did you know the ending of the book before you started writing or did it take a different turn than you expected? I, um, I knew the ending in sort of broad brush terms. So I didn't know, um, the mailman is coming and I have a dog, so just brace yourselves. I knew that the, that there would be, um, well, I guess I can't give it away, but I knew I knew the big ending. I knew that it was going to be happy, and I knew. There we go. That is Willoughby, the wonder dog. Um, so I, I, I knew enough that I was, and I think it's important. Not everyone would agree with me, so if you're a total, cancer, um, then, which means you're not plotting as you go, then maybe you do just allow it to happen naturally. But I think it's pretty important to have at least a vague idea of what is going to happen at the end. One thing that I try to do with my characters, because I like them to have the freedom to make their own choices, is that I will know this is where I have to get them to, but not how they're going to do that. So I leave that part up to them. Um, but I make sure that I'm steering the book so that it will end with them um, doing what I what I want them to do. Okay, I'm not sure what um, how many books were in that series. Uh, maybe if you're talking about the the derivative Tolkien fan fiction that I wrote, I think there were two or three. I can't really remember. Um, although I still have some of them, little bits and pieces. Okay, so I've been going on now almost an hour. Um, give or take all the time it took me to figure this out. Thank you everyone for your patience and me and my technological difficulties. Uh, I'll be here next week. Um, hopefully I can find some better um, bandwidth to to publish this on. Um, but, oh, really quick, what kind of dog is, he is a greater Swiss mountain dog, which is why he has that nice roadie. Um, bark. 
Oh, and then another one. Is The Winter King your favorite book that you've written and published? Well, it's the only book I have published. It is not it is not my favorite book, but I honestly cannot say which one is my favorite because it's like picking children. I love them all differently. So um, I'm going to hit end on this and hope that it saves it. Um, yeah, so thanks. Hopefully I'll see you next week when I'll talk a bit more about characters and plot. If you have any questions, uh, specifically about characters or plotting, you can leave them in the in the comments here or find me on Instagram. So um, you're going to get to look at me staring at the screen here for a minute while I make sure I um, turn this off without saving it. <laughs> so it's be real sad. OK.